So my, my trouble started this morning, too, as Pastor Jim was talking, because I'm on paper this morning because my tablet decided it didn't want to sync up and let me move my message to there. So I'm, I'm glad it didn't happen at 3.30 when I finally went to bed this morning. But, hey, I did have two Mountain Dews and a Pepsi that keep me awake. So as I was praying the last couple of weeks on what to talk about this morning, I knew I wanted to stay close to where we've been in the past few weeks on the early church. So we're going to go back about 30 to 40 days after resurrection, when Jesus gave what we call the Great Commission, or as some have called it, the Great Omission, since many Christians do not really follow this. And I know that by the title of the message this morning, it doesn't scream out evangelism, but I hope it makes sense as we go through things. I also know it may be controversial, given many people have many opinions of SpaghettiOs. Oh, and Pastor Tim, this is partly Pastor Tim's fault because he did challenge me a bit on using SpaghettiOs as an illustration. Oh, that was brought on by my daughter Harley, who brought that up during membership class last week. So I figure, why not just go over the top with it? We just won't do a, a quick illustration. But So this morning, let's get into our scripture verse. In order to give a little more context, I'm going to start in verse 16. Now the eleven disciples went to Galilee, to the mountains to which Jesus had directed them. And when they saw him, they worshipped him, but some doubted. And Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Now if I had just started with verse 18, we wouldn't have the context of who Jesus was talking to. <clears throat> And we know that the 11 remaining disciples were here, but many scholars believe that the 500 people that Paul mentions in 1 Corinthians were also present. 1 Corinthians 5, or 15, 6, Then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of them who are still alive, though some have fallen asleep. The message that Jesus was about to deliver applied to all of his church. So Jesus would surely have wanted to deliver it to the largest group possible of his faithful followers. John MacArthur stated, because they were there, they met Christ. Because they were there, they were commissioned. Because they were there, they received the Lord's promise of his continual presence and power as they ministered to the world in his name. And all this started by being available. So when we look at verse 17, we see that when they saw him, they worshiped Jesus. The believers were not giving homage to a human earthly ruler, but instead were worshiping God's own son, the Lord of heaven and the Lord of earth. But we also see that some doubted. As one commentator wrote, that simple phrase inserted by Matthew is only one of the countless testimonies to the integrity of scripture. In transparent honesty, Matthew sets the incident as it truly happened with no attempt to make it more dramatic or convincing than it really was. He shows Jesus in his divine perfection and Jesus' followers in their human imperfection. Even though we do not know specifically who the doubters were, it was most likely the 500 other followers as the 11 disciples had already witnessed the risen Christ. And some of them on several occasions. As Jesus came closer to them and spoke and they heard his voice, more than likely any doubt probably vanished. Now complete focus was on Jesus and what he had to say. And Jesus started by saying, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. 
The sovereign authority given to Jesus by the Father, by the Father is absolute and universal. Jesus has demonstrated during his earthly ministry his authority over disease and sickness, over demons, over sin, and even over death. We even see in John 5, 22, for the Father judges no one, but has given all judgment to the Son. Jesus wanted to establish his absolute authority before he gave his directive. Submitting to the absolute authority of Jesus is not an option for his believers, but is an obligation. It is an attitude of the believer to come with absolute sincerity, saying, whatever the Lord commands, I will do. Which is where the directive now comes. Verse 19 and the first part of 20. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. We see the word therefore in a very specific spot. Because I am sovereign Lord of everything, I have both the authority to command you to be my witnesses, and I have the power to enable you to obey that command. And we also notice this isn't to just make disciples of Israel, but of all nations. The Great Commission is the command to bring unbelievers throughout the world to a saving knowledge of Jesus. And the term used by Christ in this commissioning is make disciples. The true convert is a disciple, a person that has accepted and submitted himself to Jesus, no matter what that may entail or demand. The truly converted person is filled with the Holy Spirit and given a new nature that wants to obey and worship the Lord who has saved them. The requirements of this commission is in three parts going, baptizing, and teaching. The first, go, seems pretty clear that the church is not to wait for the world to come to its doors, but to go to the world. From my studies, the Greek participle used is best translated as having gone, suggesting that this requirement is not as much of a command as it is an assumption. The second requirement is to baptize them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Baptize literally means to immerse in water and is an act of obedience to Christ after salvation as a testimony to a union with him in his death, burial, and resurrection. Paul stated in Romans 6, verses 3 and 4, Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? We were buried, therefore, with him by baptism into death, in order that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, we too might walk in newness of life. One commentator stated, although the act of baptism has absolutely no saving or sacramental benefit of power, it is commanded by Christ of his followers. He further stated, baptism has no part in the work of salvation, but it is a God-ordained and God-commanded accompaniment of salvation. Baptism does not place a believer into oneness with the Trinity, but signifies that by God's grace, working through his faith in Jesus, the believer has already been made one with the Father and the Son, in the Holy Spirit. The third requirement for making disciples is to teach them to observe all that was commanded. The duty of the church is not to simply convert, but to teach. We are called to a life of obedience to the Lord, but in order to obey him, it is necessary to know what he is requiring of us. The participle teaching in the Greek, didasko, means keep on teaching them. Jesus is instructing to not only teach content, but to train people into obedient action. 
Basically, we must see ourselves as learners in a family of teachers who themselves are also learners. Dr. Stuart Webber wrote, the believer who is most mature will, most ready, will be most ready to listen and learn even from the newest member of the family. How many of us are ready to sit there and listen to a new follower? How many of us think we know more so we shouldn't have to? But true followers are also great listeners. And the last part of verse 20 gives us a promise. And behold, I am with you always to the end of the age. Jesus is stating, I, your resurrected, your living, your eternal Lord, am with you always to the end of the age. For the individual believer, that means all the days of their life. But for the church, it means until the Lord returns to judge the world and to rule his earthly kingdom. I want to read some excerpts from John MacArthur. <clears throat> it was never the Lord's intention to isolate Israel as his sole focus of concern, but rather to use that specially chosen and blessed nation to reach all the other nations of the world for himself. The great mission of the church is to love, learn, and live as to call men and women to Jesus Christ. As sinners are forgiven and are transformed from death to life and from darkness to light, God is glorified through that gracious miracle. The glory of God is manifest in his loving provisions to redeem lost men. He himself paid the ultimate price to fulfill his glory. <clears throat> he also says, if God's primary purpose for the saved were loving fellowship, he would take believers immediately to heaven where spiritual fellowship is perfect, unhindered by sin, disharmony, or loneliness. If his primary purpose for the saved were the learning of his word, he would also take believers immediately to heaven, where his word is perfectly known and understood. And if God's primary purpose for the saved were to give him praise, he would again take believers immediately to heaven where praise is perfect and unending. There is only one reason the Lord allows his church to remain on earth, to seek and to save the lost, just as Christ's only reason for coming to earth was to seek and save the lost. John 20, verse 21, Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you, as the Father has sent me, even so... I am sending you. And this is where John MacArthur's words really stung. Therefore, a believer who is not committed to winning the loss for Jesus Christ should re-examine his relationship to the Lord and certainly his divine reason for existence. And MacArthur followed it up with, many Christians are preoccupied with the spiritually insignificant and show little commitment to reaching the lost. The harsh reality is we are told to share the gospel with others, to bring them to Christ, and we don't. This book study that Pastor Harold is leading has been great so far. The book is called One Thing You Can't Do in Heaven. I tell you what, though, the second chapter should have been called Pastor Timothy Smothers. <clears throat> the author of Mark Cahill goes and says we have the wrong perspective. It isn't that we have got to go to church, but that we to. go to church. We think that we have got to pray, but we have to pray to the Almighty God. 
It isn't that we have got to read the Bible, but we need to have the mindset that we We have a great story to tell. And we should want to share it. Even though we are told to go and make disciples, we should look at it as we get to go and make disciples. Because when we leave this life, it isn't that we have got to go to heaven, but we get to go to heaven. And if we are not sharing then we are not doing our part. I was reading an article from DesiringGod.org on evangelism where it talks about fear. Some of that comes from not feeling like you are prepared to evangelize. <clears throat> well, if we look at 1 Peter 3, 15, Peter shows us what we need to do to be prepared. But in your hearts, honor Christ the Lord as holy always being prepared to make a defense to anyone who asks you for a reason for the hope that is in you. Yet do it with gentleness and respect. We speak out of what we are full of. We're always evangelizing about something. We are always speaking of what is holy to us. If something is sacred, set apart, consecrated of first importance, it'll overflow from our hearts and into our conversation. So Peter counsels us to fill our hearts with Christ the Lord. 1 Peter 3, 12 and 13. For the eyes of the Lord are the righteous, are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Now, who is there to harm you if you are zealous for what is good? Instead of looking to see what words we can speak to get the most acceptance or the least amount of opposition, we are told to focus our discernment elsewhere. <clears throat> I'm not going to choose my words according to how they're received. My discernment should center on the origin of the words more than the destination. Do these words come from a heart that honors Christ the Lord? Isaiah 8 12 and 13. Do not call conspiracy all that this people calls conspiracy. And do not fear what they fear, nor be in dread. But the Lord of hosts, him you shall honor as holy. Let him be your fear, and let him be your dread. This goes back to a message I gave last year on the fear of the Lord. The fear of the Lord is not about cowering away from God. It's actually about being magnetically attracted to, possessed with, and in awe of his all-compelling glory and majesty. This should be a liberating fear. It means that when it comes to evangelism, we fight fear with fear. The fears will come. We are not perfect. But as we enter a conversation, we are not to be awed by the desire to be liked. Instead, we should be awed by the all-surpassing greatness of Christ. 2 Corinthians 5.11 Therefore, knowing the fear of the Lord, we persuade others. But what we are is known to God, and I hope it is known also to your conscience. As we get to know the Lord and his words better, the better, and the better we can share his words with others. And this brings us to my final point this morning and where the spaghetti has come into play. Our denomination participates in a multiply or amplify conference every year. And one of the big things is talking about our evangelism temperature. As a church, we have read several Tom Rainer books together at one time or another. And he has one that's called Sharing the Gospel with Ease. I have not read it yet, but I will be ordering a copy to take a look at. But I found it from this little quiz on your evangelism temperature. 
I have copies that I'll take downstairs. So if you want to take one and do the quiz and take a look, you can. And if we run out, we can print more. But you might find some of these statistics rather interesting. We go from super hot, where less than 1% of Christians fall, down to cool and cold, where 80% of Christians fall on the scale. And that number should astound you. When you look at the score, where, what it means, your temperature indicates you are disobedient to the Great Commission most of the time. Or, if you're below 20 on the scale, your temperature indicates you are disobedient to the Great Commission all the time. 80% of Christians fall under there. So if you think about it, every 10 people here in this church, you're lucky to have two that are actually sharing the gospel with others. Now you may have to think back to when you were growing up, but SpaghettiOs were always a big thing when I was growing up. And regardless if you like SpaghettiOs or not, chances are almost all of you have had them at one point in time. So how do you like your SpaghettiOs? And I'm not talking about with or without meatballs or with Mario or Luigi or even Star Wars characters for the noodles. But do you really like them out of the can? Or do you like them hot? To me, I cannot stand eating them cold. They need to be hot. A lot of times you're not going to get anyone to eat SpaghettiOs cold or even lukewarm. And this is just like evangelism. If you are lukewarm for God, how are you going to get out a great gospel message that people want to hear? If you open up the can and serve that to people, they're going to have a lot of leftovers because no one's going to want it. Paul wrote to Timothy, 2 Timothy 1.6, For this reason I remind you to fan the flame the fan into flame, the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of my hands. We need to find ways to fan the fire of that gift of God. And so I found some things that you can do to help raise your temperature. And Pastor Tim and I attended Amplify in 2020. It was virtual that year because of COVID. <clears throat> it's one of the few benefits of COVID. And so I want to share a few things from that. The first thing is five ways to raise our evangelism temperature. First, reading the word. We need to be reading God's word daily. How better to get more comfortable in sharing the gospel than having these words in our hearts. The second way is in prayer. Go to God in passionate prayer. God wants to hear from us, especially when we, when we recognize that he has power and authority over all things. One person wrote, pray boldly and often. Three, testimony. Have your testimony ready to give. In one of my classes, I was told to have a 30th second testimony handy. Because generally you have 30 to 60 seconds to give your testimony to someone before they don't want to hear anymore. It needs to be impactful. Number four, proximity. Be near from those far from Jesus. And number five, fruit. Talk about what God is doing. What he's doing for you in your life. What he's doing for your church. What he's doing for those that are lost. And as they were getting ready to tell us the five best practices, they gave us a little bit on blessers versus converters. God blessed Abraham so he could bless. 
Missionaries to Thailand tested this emphasis and found a focus on blessing people resulted in more conversations than an emphasis on preaching. Preaching is teaching. And someone that isn't a follower of Christ, they're not going to listen. They're not going to have that desire for that. And that's one reason why we started with the Pulse program, blessing our first responders. So the best five practices. Begin with prayer. Following the example of Jesus, this is how we do the mission and how we discover the mission. Listen. Jesus healed the blind man, but first he listened to the man. Do you want to be healed? Christians seem to be best known for our talking, not our listening. Third is eat. Jesus ate with people. Man, that's where the Baptists got it from. The religious people complained that Jesus was eating and drinking with sinners. Not a focus on having the right dialogue or program to, file, to follow. We have meals every day. 21 opportunities weekly to interact and share our faith. Fourth is serve. Matthew 20, 20 verse 28. I came not to be served, but to serve. The early church served too. And the fifth one, story. Share the story of Jesus, your story of coming to and walking with Jesus. The proclamation as a last step. And remember, be in prayer and be in God's word. You're not going to get anywhere if you try to serve lukewarm SpaghettiOs. You need to get them hot for God. And people will listen to you and be drawn to you and will want what you're serving. Father God, we're, we're thankful, Lord, for you, for your message, for your love. for the word that we get to read. Lord, we have that Holy Spirit in us when we accepted you. We have you living in us to guide us. We should not have any fear of sharing what you've done for us or sharing what you have done for many, many others. Because you died on the cross for all sins if they accept you. Even that thief on the cross, Lord, he believed in you, accepted you, and we know that he is with you. Lord, we have the best message of all to give. Where so many people have no hope. But we do. And it's up to us to share that hope with others. Lord, impress upon us the desire to read your word. To go before you in prayer. To have your words imprinted upon us. Lord, you started off by sharing your words. The disciples continued it. And it's up to us to keep continuing it. To help spread the gospel message across the entire world. So that when it is spread across the world, we know it's your time to come back. And what a glorious time that will be, Lord when you call your people home, all of them, and you start your earthly reign. 
Lord, we just give you all the praise and glory that, of what you've done for us. And Lord, we just hope that our message to others is glorifying to you as well. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.